This podcast is supported by Manitou Fund. We want to thank them for coming on board and, and helping to support this podcast. really means a lot to us. Zach, you ready? Get set, go. <laughs> Get set, go. Okay, uh, this is the Fieldwork Podcast. I am Mitchell Hora. And I am Zach Johnson. And as Mitchell said, you are tuning into the Fieldwork Podcast, but you probably already knew that because you're here to hear all the awesomeness. You made that choice, and we're going to roll with it. And by now, it's clearly your most favoritist podcast ever. Obviously. Um, I I think it's it's number one in the world right now, I believe. Yeah, number one in the world. We are so awesome. Number one in the world, in your hearts. (laughs) In your hearts and on the iTunes ratings because of all of your likes and ratings and five stars that you give us. <laughs> so, okay. So Fieldwork is a show hosted by farmers. And for farmers. For farmers. And that's, that's us. That's, that's yeah. me. That's my neighbors. I mean, farmers love this thing. Yeah. Farmers love field work. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges uh, as farmers know, um, especially in talking about sustainable ag practices and uh, being able to adopt some of those things. That's right. And we want to dig into the challenges, the benefits, the uh, the different practices. And we want to talk all about that here on the podcast. Today, we are talking about carbon markets, more specifically, a new part of the carbon market where farmers can actually get paid for ecosystem services. And some of you are probably going, what the heck is an ecosystem? Ser- a, a what? What? Okay. <laughs> ecosystem services. Sound it out. Sound it out. out. (laughs) Ecosystem services are the benefits that we can get from properly functioning ecosystems, things like carbon sequestration. So these carbon markets make me really excited that even with this coronavirus outbreak going on and and the carbon emissions being throttled back due to the, the economy being kind of brought back a little bit, there's still plenty of carbon as CO2 in the atmosphere. And these markets are looking to get farmers paid to pull that carbon out of the atmosphere through some of the practices that we talk about on the podcast. Yeah, really, really interesting. Some crazy stuff here that probably my great grandparents didn't sit down and and talk about stuff like this. But right now, there's actually companies out there willing to pay for that carbon sequestration that's happening on farms. So the, the bottom line really is that these carbon markets are another way to possibly make a buck or two on our farms maybe for the things that we're already doing here anyways. That uh, sounds pretty darn good to me, Zach. Um, We're going to talk to one of the guys that's helping to lead the charge here, Christoph Jospe. He is the chief development officer for Nori. And Nori is one of those companies, Zach mentioned, that's helping to get farmers paid for putting carbon back into the ground. Full disclosure here, um, I do have a a relationship with Nori. Um, I do have a farm that's actually signed up for their program, seeing how this could work for my family's operation. So you're saying it is, this is not a conspiracy. This is not a, not a conspiracy. This is actually happening right now. And, uh, evaluating the farming practices that we're doing on our farm and actual carbon testing in the soil to evaluate how much carbon do we have in our soil right now and how much additional carbon could I sequester as we continue to move forward with our farming practices. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's dig in here. Christoph Jospe from Nori, you're the chief development officer of Nori and a founder. What does Nori think about ecosystem markets and how does that differentiate from a carbon market? Yeah, good question. And thanks for having me on. Carbon is just one piece of an ecosystem service market. So oftentimes when people are talking about ecosystem service markets in 2020, they're talking about carbon sequestration, water holding capacity, um, water retention, carbon reduction, maybe nutrient density. And Nori is only focused on the carbon removal. So really what that means at the end of the day is the increase in soil organic matter or soil organic carbon in U.S. croplands. Yeah, so it's the actual organic matter... And then a piece of that being the organic carbon. So really focusing on that. But what's your kind of definition, though, of like what is an ecosystem service market? I guess the best way to think of it is like a digital crop that you can sell. So along with physical grain crops, there are 
abstractions from the improvement that you might be able to do to your land and then sell that, whether that's to companies who want that information in their supply chain or companies, I think the airline industry is a great example, who are looking to offset their carbon emissions by paying someone else who can remove an equal amount. And in this case, we're talking about U.S. farmers who can take it out of the atmosphere and store it in their soils. So you, t- you talked about it being a digital crop that you can sell. Explain to me how that works. I mean, what is, what is a carbon market? Yeah, so carbon markets are not a new concept. They've actually been around for over two decades. And they came about because a lot of people were worried about this idea of climate change and carbon dioxide accumulating in the atmosphere and changing the climate. And the idea of carbon markets were if you could incentivize people who could do things that could reduce or remove carbon, that that could address the excess CO2 in the atmosphere. And so there are a lot of different ideas that have come around. Some of your listeners might be familiar with the Chicago Climate Exchange, which was an early form of a carbon market. California actually has its own type of carbon market called cap and trade, where they're actually putting a cap on the emissions of industrial emissions and then squeezing that cap over time, whereby if the emitters can't emit less than that cap, then they actually have to go out and buy a digital representation that has proof that it's actually a ton of CO2 reduced. And the most important thing in carbon markets is this concept of additionality. So people who are paying to offset their emissions, their carbon emissions, are want to know that what they're paying for is something above and beyond what would have otherwise happened. So the first thing that carbon markets are going to be looking for is what is the baseline and then what's the improvement over that baseline. And ultimately, that difference is what people who can do that activity to remove carbon can monetize. So really, it boils down to there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere from airplanes and cars and industry and agriculture and whatever. But through agriculture and through some of these practices, we can capture that CO2, put it in the ground and get paid. That's basically it. So like, but so how does that work? Like, it's a market system. And obviously, Nori is like, so Nori is basically the facilitator of that. What was the the terminology there the that we had started with the the, the, the virtual credit kind of system and basically Nori kind of like oversees that yeah so Nori is creating a market and we're also a marketplace and so what that means is that we help people who can remove carbon essentially generate a unit which they can sell. And so for Nori, we call that an NRT. It's a Nori carbon removal ton. There are other efforts out there. Maybe some of your listeners have heard of Indigo Ag. They're working with the Climate Action Reserve, which is making CRTs, climate reserve tons. There's another standard body out there called the Verified Carbon Standard. They make VCUs. And essentially, all of those acronyms in alphabet soup are the same idea, is that the people who are doing that activity are creating a unit that they can sell. There are differences in the implementation details on how it all works. And I'll be honest, in 2020, we're kind of in the Wild West of how do we figure this out and what's the most efficient way to figure it out. And a lot of it comes down to how certain can you be of what actually is happening in the soil, in the ground. Explain, Christoph, how does... How does that work in the ground? How exactly does carbon sequestration work? Yeah, so you guys would know better than I do that when you leave certain residue on your field or you don't till or you start keeping roots in the ground longer, whether that's through cover crops or what have you, that your soil's getting darker and you're increasing your soil organic matter. And earlier I was talking about this concept of additionality. And so What we're looking for are what are the new practices, whether you call that regenerative practices, conservation practices, climate smart agriculture, what have you. Essentially, you're letting the soil do the work. And at the end of the day, 
what it's coming from is photosynthesis. So you've got plants, they want to eat CO2, they're taking that CO2, they're passing that through into the root matter, um, and over time, the soil organic matter is increasing. There are also fast-track ways to just put more organic matter by applying manure or compost or other microbial amend- or stimulants. So it all kind of depends. For nori and other carbon markets too, what we want to look for is how can we create that baseline that's above and beyond what would have otherwise happened. So what we're looking at to compare against when people are participating in this market is when are they doing something new and how can we compare that to their neighbors? So a real simple example is if you've been farming corn and soy and tilling intensely and then you transition to introducing a no-till system and adding cover crops, that's now something new. And the difference between that, not only are you going to be increasing your soil organic matter from doing that activity, but ecosystem service markets like Nori would be able to help you monetize the difference. And the idea behind that is that this is something that emitters want to pay for. And as you guys know, oftentimes when you're doing that, it's not even about the selling something for the money, you might be on a track of farming that's way more profitable anyway. Is there a unit of measurement that you're actually using to measure the carbon sequestration here? Or are you really just looking at the practices that get added or, or taken out of the equation that we know helps to increase the sequestration? Mm. That's a great question, Zach. Thank you. <laughs> Zach, th- that is the million-dollar question that Two million people dollar question. are... Two million dollar question. <laughs> so many people are asking, like, how, how does the measurement actually work? I mean, if I'm going to get pedantic for a second, you can't actually measure soil carbon. You can only estimate it. And so the question is, how do we estimate it with greater and greater precision? So Nori is an outcome market, meaning that people are able to monetize the outcome of the increase in soil organic carbon from the baseline to at the end of the term of the contract, which in our case is 10 years. But we also need to know what practices people were doing so that we can isolate the additionality question. And the reason for that is because, as you know, weather patterns make the soil carbon go up or down based on nothing additional that you might do of your own intention. And so the way that we have built this market is to use something called a dynamic baseline. And we've integrated with a platform called Comet Farm. And we're able to collect farm operating data and use that to establish a baseline. Now, here's the thing. That's essentially using a model that's able to take into all of these factors and isolate out what are those additional things that we can qualify. So in my example, I gave you like cover crops, no-till. Those would be additional and the Nori market can now project out what additional carbon's going down. But the model is only so precise, and it actually comes with uncertainty ranges. And we know that there are ways to take measurements in the ground where you can actually also get soil organic carbon readings. And so we have a way in which, at a bare minimum, year 10 in this contract, there's an audit that includes soil sampling. So it includes that measurement, but... The kicker is we need to be able to isolate those practices because what we don't want to see is if you're in a region that it's very soil rich and you're not even doing anything, your soil carbon is just going up and down, but you're not doing anything additional. If you scooped up a core sample one year and then another year, you could show a difference and monetize that difference, but it wouldn't be because you're changing behavior or on a path where you, as a farmer, are trying to sell ecosystem services. Well, Christoph, we have a lot more questions to ask, but we're going to take a real quick break, and we'll be right back. That's right. We will be right back. We'll be (laughs) right back? We will be. Welcome back. We're talking about carbon markets today with Christoph Jospe from Nori. Back to your point on we can't actually quantify the carbon. And what you mean there is like at massive scale across an entire, you can't dig up a whole acre of soil and like weigh out how much carbon is in it. You have to either look at 
some soil samples, which is a small little subset of what is out there relative to like, okay, how much do we think is out there based on the soil test? And then utilize the model to look at the management practices with some range of certainty or whatever that, hey, these things are happening. So they equate to carbon sequestration. But I think another point, good point is, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do this and each farm is going to be different too. That yeah, cover crops and no-till can be one way to, to help, but even just by managing fertilizer better, even by, you know, managing that crop better or, or keeping in a good rotation, there's a lot of, or you had brought up too, adding manure, compost, other amendments. There's a lot of different ways that a farmer can contribute to their carbon sequestration. Mitchell, you mentioned there's a lot of different ways that a farmer can contribute to that. So my question now for Christoph is, as a farmer, if I'm interested in in looking at some of these markets and the possibilities of what I can do on my farm, how do I actually go about getting paid? I know Nori helps a little bit with, with figuring that out, but explain to me for somebody who's naive on the topic, how do I go about that? Really good question. Well, just to give Mitchell a shout out, talking to Mitchell might be a fast track way to do it. What if what if you're Nori, just sick and tired of talking to Mitchell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, but I'll, in all seriousness, <laughs> we've got a pilot underway. And in carbon markets, there's this important concept called ex post. Ex post means you get paid for the thing after you did the thing. And so for Nori... What that means is every NRT, the Nori Carbon Removal Ton, that sellable asset, actually comes with a year associated with it. And in this day and age, well, in this year, we have an opportunity for people who in the last 10 years are able to prove that they did something new so that we could basically create a projection out of how much more carbon is getting down because they adopted a regenerative or conservation practice, they can get paid for up to five years worth of grandfathered credits, grandfathered NRTs. Now, what that means is that we got to work with the farm. We got to look at the farm. They have to select the fields that they want to enter into Nori. Um, They don't need to select all the fields. It can be a subset of a few. Um, We need to figure out how do we get the data. And all this is on our website. So we've got information of what's the data that we're asking for. It, at a bare minimum, includes field boundaries, seeding and harvesting dates, yields, fertilizer application, irrigation, liming, burning, um, organic matter additions. And then we're able to run that data through this USDA tool which, while it's a great tool, it's really clunky and it takes a lot of data entry time. And so ideally, the farmers who are interested are working with the farm management software platform, whether that's something like Granular or My John Deere or Climate Field View or what have you, that's able to just export the information that we need. We then take all that in, we create an account, we give a projection back to the farmer that says, here's what you might earn, And then we automate a third-party verification report. When the farmer pays the verifier, we then convert what we call a carbon removal claim into a Nori carbon removal ton, assuming that that verifier says this is accurate. And that's really the kicker because that's where that third party is able to assess, is this information that this person's reporting to me accurate or not? If it turns out that it's not accurate, Well, it probably is going to be more costly and they'll need to pay again the verifier and actually make sure it's right. But once they have that unit of measure, they can then take it to our marketplace. They can take the NRT to our marketplace and get paid. And we really try to breathe the mantra under promise so we can over deliver. So I'm not promising that right now it's easy. I mean, we're very much looking for the early adopters. And so for the people who maybe are listening to this and they're like, all right, this regenerative agriculture thing, it sounds interesting. How do I get paid for it? I haven't done anything yet. Well, they could still enroll into the Nori marketplace, but because we're ex post, they would need to wait probably at least three years until they can see any type of soil organic carbon accruals that they can sell through our marketplace. 
Yeah, so it's mostly looking at new stuff that you're going to add onto your farm. But you can also, if you've done something over the last 10 years, you can plug in some of that information. So Zach could go on there and say, hey, I've been improving my split applications. I've been reducing tillage. I've been doing these things. And then you guys will give him an estimate. But then if he's going to actually create the nori carbon removal ton, there is a different verification process. You'd mentioned that, that the farmer would actually have to pay something to actually get like third party verified. That's right. And our goal is not to put verifiers out of a job, but to make verification as cheap as possible. And so the more we can gather information that is indisputable, whether that's through satellites, whether that's through sensors that are actually on your tractor moving through um, and just create those reports, the cheaper verification is going to be and the more everyone wins. Zach, what do you think? What's the pushback going to be in your in your area? The the pushback. If you go to your dad and be like, "Hey, we want to get paid for carbon." What's he going to What's he going to say? Um, I think. Well, I think the first thing he's going to ask is, "How does that work?" Yeah, yeah. How do you know? I, I, nobody's going to be against getting paid for something, 100%. but how does this work? What's the process look like? And and some of the questions that we've had here today. I'm curious. You glanced over a little bit about blockchain. You had mentioned that, and we hear a lot about that right now, but. What do you think blockchain is going to do for agriculture? And more specifically, as far as Nori is involved, what is it going to do and how is it going to help when it comes to the carbon market side of things? There are two things going on. One is the Nori token and the other is the data that's stored on the blockchain. Now, the token is a commodity. And so in the same way that farmers are paying attention to commodity prices fluctuating and making decisions based on when to sell, we see an opportunity where we want that token to actually represent over time the value of the NRT, the Nori Carbon Removal Ton. And just to be clear, today it's all happening in the background and people are getting paid in cash. And so you can sell your NRT for 15 bucks and you get a coupon or a Nori token, which could have value in the future. And if the token's trading for 15 bucks, you can sell your NRT and you can cash out at 15 bucks. But what I think is even more exciting when it comes to blockchain and ag is that if you're putting data onto essentially the blockchain is an immutable ledger, that's the jargon word, meaning you're storing it on a thing that can't be changed. That data is valuable for more than just carbon markets. It can be valuable for reporting up the supply chain, which potentially provides a price premium back to the grower. And it also can be valuable um, when you are just looking to lower the costs of verification, whether that's through carbon markets or any program that you might be enrolled in. Yeah, so really the blockchain piece is just going to be able to provide consistent data that can't be messed with, it can't be tampered with, um, but it's there on the blockchain where it's accessible if you want to play into a sustainable market through like your grain buyer or through an ecosystem market like Nori? If you think of the software Nori's building as a pizza pie, just one slice of what we're doing is the blockchain. The rest of it is how do we get data in a smart and efficient way so that we make it as easy as possible for growers not to need to spend a lot of time entering data. And I think that is a goal that many of those in the ag technology world are moving toward. Are there a lot of companies out there doing things like this, um, similar to what Nori's doing with trying to come up with carbon markets and help farmers out on that end of things? There are a few different efforts. No one's going about it the way that we're doing it in terms of creating an actual market. Indigo Agriculture does have an initiative called the Terraton Challenge, which is similar. And for growers participating in that challenge and assigning their carbon removal over for indigo to sell, they couldn't list those same fields in Nori. There's also another effort that's more of a consortium called the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium. And there are other carbon registries or standards bodies who are working on coming up with methodologies. And so... We're very keen to see all of these things work, and we're of the view that competition is good and cross-pollination means that everyone can move further faster. 
All right, Christoph, interesting information here. I think there's a lot of a lot of different ways that this can go, but uh, I'm really interested to see where in the future this takes off because this is really interesting stuff. Well, and it, and it sounds like, okay, 20 to 30. So there's one farmer initially, now 20 to 30 farmers. We have millions that listen to us, of course, because we're awesome. Yep, tens of farmers. <laughs> so they, where do they go? You know, can other people get signed up for this now? They can. I mean, the easiest place for them to go is to our website. That's nori.com. There's a page for growers where they can read more about the program. There are FAQs in there, and there's a link on there to apply to the program. That doesn't mean that everyone who applies we're able going to we're going to be able to work with right now. And part of our strategy is to actually work with those independent crop consultants who are able to support growers to access the nori market. And so if people are interested, they can go to our website. If they see a question, if they have a question that isn't answered there, we encourage them to ask it. Transparency is a key value of ours, so we want to make sure that whatever information we're putting out there reflects the reality of how this program is actually going to work. But yeah, the truth is we can't work with everyone all at once. And so we have to be smart about how we scale this business. It's worth giving a shout out to a program called Ag Launch that is actually helping entrepreneurs in the ag tech space, which has been useful for Nori to think about how do we grow this really strategically and make sure that we line up the right partners who can support this. Awesome. All good information. Well, thank you for joining us today, Christoph. Uh, that's been Christoph Jospe, the development officer for Nori, one of the companies that's actually paying farmers for putting carbon back into the ground. We'll be watching our mailboxes for our checks coming any day soon. Any day. <laughs> it's been a pleasure being on here. Thanks a lot, guys. So quick epilogue to that interview. We recorded it before COVID-19 became a big thing. And uh, since that time, I've talked with Christoph for an update on how his business is doing. Um, he says, you know, some of the companies that were looking at buying carbon credits that were in the travel industry, like the airlines and the cruise industry and stuff like that, they've definitely kind of dialed back on their aggressiveness of their carbon market. But some other companies um, that are in the supply chain, that are in food, that are in other businesses, they're still full speed ahead. And now it's time on the podcast to check out what's going on in our voicemail. Let's see what we got today. Hey, Zach and Mitch. My name is Tom. I'm a 21-year-old college student in Virginia. I don't have an agricultural background, but I have had the good fortune to meet some friends at school that are dairy farmers, and I've gotten really familiar with that aspect of agriculture here in my state. But my question for you is how can farmers become more diversified in the future? I remember there was a time not too long ago within this century, farmers milked cows in the morning. They had chickens that laid eggs. They had hogs. There were more crops in the field than corn and soybeans. But now, corn and soybeans, especially in the Midwest, are dominant. They are dominant in my area along with dairy. And there's been a, a decreasing amount of diversification. Do you guys think it's possible as we aim for more sustainability and more profit that farmers add more crops to their rotation, they add more ways of revenue? Or do you think a specialization in focusing on one or two different types of crops and trying to optimize their land that way is the better? Should farmers diversify or should farmers specialize even more? Love the podcast and keep on trucking. Thank you. Hey, Tom, thanks, man, for uh, calling in. Really good question here and something that I've actually been thinking a lot about, you know, that one of these soil health principles is to foster diversity. So we know that we do need to figure out this component, whether that be, you know, diversify of crops and animals, but really it's diversifying revenue streams as well. Obviously, the corn and soybean market right now um, isn't really working. Um not just doesn't look good at least it might be able to hang on and and we'll get through it and i'm sure there will be light on the other end of the tunnel but 
um, this is a really good opportunity, I think, to look at diversifying. So wh- how I am approaching this, though, is that it's not just planting something different. You know, so I'm farming in Iowa. I have really great soils. I can grow a lot of different things. And we're really grateful for that. But I have to be able to logistically grow that crop, have the equipment to do it, have the know-how to do it, be able to fine tune, you know, my equipment, my fertility program, my herbicide program, or, or lack thereof, you know, for these different crops. Another key thing, probably the most crucial thing is you have to have a market for these crops. So you have to be able to get it to work economically or else it just, it does not make sense. We have to be able to make these decisions as a business decision. Yeah, they have environmental outcomes. Yeah, they're an important part of soil health, but they have to make business sense. What we're doing on our farm is we're looking at diversifying crops. Okay. So I'm not set up to be able to manage livestock right now. I live um, not directly on the farm, so I'm not there every single day. Um, So we're looking at other crops. Um, what I'm doing is sharing in the risk and the reward of growing those other crops with the companies that I'm working with that are buying my product. Okay. So it's not just going into these completely blind, no idea how to do it. No idea what the economics are going to be. I have the contracts in place at the beginning and I know that I've got some, some downside protection there and hopefully be able to share in some of the upside as well. Um, so I think even if you're bringing in other crops or bringing on cattle or chickens or something else, you can find some of those markets and make sure that this is going to be a good business decision going in. So I think that's the the key thing for me. Um, also think about what about diversifying as you know carbon being a crop or things like that. I mean, uh, but there's a there's a lot of ways to approach this. Um, but be smart about it and. Um, hopefully there can be a really good business decision to be made here. Um, and one that a lot of other people can adopt too. I think this is a good opportunity to reset, look at your farm and find new opportunity to diversify and, uh, be able to come out stronger. That's it for field work today. Thanks to all the people who helped make field work possible. Annie Baxter, Amy Scotchless Cole, Claire Jones, Noah Boston, Kristen Schmidt, Eric Romani, and Lauren Humpert. Our theme song is written and performed by Johnny Vince Evans with help from Corey Schreppel. Our website is fieldworktalk.org, and we're Fieldwork Talk on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If you like our show, uh, we want you to write a review. That would be great. And uh, we'd love to get a voicemail from you. You can call us up, and we'll play your voicemail on our show. Leave us a comment or a question at 651 228 Four eight one zero. That's six five one two two eight four eight one zero. Thanks everybody for listening. Mm-hmm.